Andy Cadell, you may have thought last week sucked for you with Florida State <laughs> losing. It won't be as bad as it will be for me tonight. Yeah, that could be a painful one, Zach. I feel for you. Uh, thankfully, I've never had to live through a run like that with <laughs> Florida State. We've had some rough years, but like not where you're a 42-point dog which I would probably say Lamb with Oklahoma. They got Jackson Arnold, young quarterback, making his debut. I feel, But remember when Temple was like the time, I think it was, was it Al Golden who like really kind of put them on the map? And yeah. then it became like this job that was really like a good job. Matt Rule took it, parlayed it into the job at Baylor. Like it was a good spot. I don't know what's happening there, man. I feel for you. <laughs> Rod Carey is my least favorite person of all time. He ended up taking that job and just totally ruined the program. But like, let's be real. I could get worked up over it. The little guy doesn't really have a spot in college football now anymore with name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal. Like when I was there, they developed Hassan Reddick from a walk on to a top 15 pick. And now it's just like, okay, you develop a player. He's going to get just taken away, you know, the year he starts to be good in the transfer portal. Yeah, it's brutal. And I've talked to a lot of group of five coaches um, who just feel helpless, hopeless. Like, what are we supposed to do? And really all they want is some sort of system that tries to slow it down. Because I think they understand, like, basically, Zach, what we're, what we're, what we're developing into – organically, and I thought this for a couple years now, is essentially minor league NFL. And in minor league baseball, what do we have? Single A, double A, triple A. And then you got the big leagues, right? So let's say the big leagues is the NFL. Let's say the triple A is SEC Big Ten. Double A is ACC and Big 12. Single A is all those group of five schools. Well, I played minor league baseball. You know what happens? Sometimes sometimes they draft a kid first round, they stick him in triple A, and they're like, uh-oh, he He's not ready for it. And he gets sent down. And we see players sent down, so to speak, to the group of five level. Uh, there's a quarterback, TJ Finley, who's starting for Western Kentucky against Alabama. He was at Auburn. He was at Ala, you know, he was in the SEC and didn't cut it. So he gets sent down. Then on the flip side, what do you see? Players start in single A, they get called up, and sometimes they make the jump just to double A. And what's crazy, Zach, is we're actually seeing players jump three times in a career, sometimes four, and they're just kind of working their way up. The system is figuring itself out. Where does this player belong? And then they end up playing where they are. But the coaches that I talk to, I think they want some sort of compensation, some sort of <laughs> consolation prize for the fact that they develop those players. You know, like they did, and they do a lot of work, and they find a lot of talent. I think that's where they feel burned the most. So like we see with coaches getting bought out of contracts, maybe there's some sort of pay that you get to bring a player from their roster into your school, um, you know, an extra scholarship, something to make them feel like they don't just get raided because we've seen that happen too. And it's just, it's not fair. It stinks for those lower tier problem, uh, programs. And yet I think even the coaches understand the opportunity that's there to make money and play at a bigger school, a lot of those coaches would do the same thing if the opportunity was there. So they understand it. They just want some sort of fairness where they're given something in return for the player they developed. Danny Cannell here with us. We know with the 12-team playoff, you could afford to lose a week one game. But with what you saw from Florida State, where is your concern level moving on the rest of the season, knowing what the standard is? It's to be one of the 12 teams in the playoff at the end of the year. Yeah, I'm not thinking about the 12-team playoff right now for Florida State. I don't even think Mike Norvell, the coach at Florida State, is thinking about that. He's thinking, oh my gosh, we got a lot of issues we got to correct. And that's all you can do in his position. The thing that was most startling to me was the, the offensive line and the defensive line, the lines of scrimmage, where Florida State is more talented. They've got more four- and five-star talent, more expected NFL talent. And they got worked. They got pushed around. They could not establish the run game outside of that first drive. So that was my first, like, uh-oh. Then the second thing, and I do think Mike Norvell, he's talked a little bit about this after the game. He needs to do a better job. There was a lot of missed assignments from the linebackers on defense that kind of were out of position, got gashed. I think he also needs to call a more aggressive game. I think he was a little bit conservative with DJ Uyunglele, the quarterback that came in the transfer. And I think he's going to have to open it up because the one adjustment Georgia Tech made after that first drive where Florida State marched down the field, 
They were like, we're not going to let that happen again. So we're going to load up the box. We're going to make sure that, you know, go ahead, go try to beat us, DJ. And they, instead of trying to take some shots, they just kept trying to run the ball. And it was like into a brick wall because they had, they were outnumbered up there in the box. So I think floor, I think Mike Norvell will make some of those adjustments. I think you'll see DJ given the opportunity to throw the ball down the field. Now we'll see if he capitalizes on it and if he can take advantage of it, which he did in the fourth quarter when they had to, but that's what I expect from Florida state. And I think they'll get better. Yeah. It was alarming. It was almost like they didn't trust him in week one for like the first three quarters when I was watching him. Yeah, I thought that too. But see, here's the thing. That's what, so I wanted Cam Ward, who's the starting quarterback for Miami. Sure. Like if anything burns Florida State fans, it's going to hurt, especially if he plays as good as I think he can play. Um, but DJU was sort of this game manager, which I know is used as a pejorative and it's a negative term, but it does give you stability. Like as he played okay. He played well enough to win. Like he didn't make the big mistake. And I think that's what happens with some young quarterbacks. And that's what they have behind DJU players that might make a big mistake, pick six, you know, boneheaded interceptions. DJ played within the system and he did what they asked him to do. That's what I thought you would get from him. And early in the season, I thought that would be enough. That's where I was wrong. And I do think that's where Mike Norvell was wrong because I thought the defense would be able to dominate early while the offense builds up some confidence. That's not the way it's going to work. They're going to have to, they're going to have to open things up. And to your point, I do think it was, I don't know if it was trust or let's just, let's not put DJ in a tough spot early. Let's wait till we, you know, let's wait and give him some confidence, give him some easy throws, give him some good games. They're not going to have that luxury now from what we saw. Boston College has a pretty dynamic quarterback in Thomas Castellanos who almost beat them last year. They're going to get challenged. Florida State's going to have to step up, but we'll see how they respond. But I do think, to your point, it did look like they didn't trust them, but I think that was kind of part of the game plan as well. Talking to Danny Cannell, when you get to Colorado last night, you could go positive, you could go negative. If you only had one takeaway from the game, what's your takeaway? I, they are fun to watch. I mean, it's like, and whether you, because I think there's a lot of people that hate them, a lot of people that love them, and a lot that just, you know, like me, that just want to just wanna sit back and, and be entertained. And every time they take the field, they are entertaining, right? Like that game, they, I thought that game would be entertaining. The Like, so I, I was asking people, like, do you feel better or worse about Colorado? And I would have to say I feel the same because – what we saw was basically a carryover from last year. I knew Shador Sanders was going to play well. He did all last season. You know, I knew Travis Hunter, who I still think is the best pure football player in the country. The dude is unbelievable playing both sides of the ball, being one of the best receivers in the country. I think he's one of the best defensive backs too. But like, how is the offensive line? Still very much a question mark as Shador took some sacks. How is the defense? Still very much a concern because it didn't look much better than it did last year. So kind of like what we were talking about with Florida State, were those adjustable? Like, can they make the adjustments? Yeah, I think they can be better coached. There were some position things where they were out of position. There were some wide open North Dakota State receivers running open. Um, and is it, you know, is there room for improvement? I would say yes. So I, but like coming in, their win total was five and a half. It was kind of, it wasn't one of my favorite plays. I might have leaned over because I think their roster is better this season. But it looked very similar to what we saw last year, like playing down to the competition. I I probably feel the same. Like I think a bowl, which is six wins, would be probably a good season considering the talent on this team and the schedule, which is going to get a lot harder. Let me be clear, Danny Canal. I want them to make a bowl game because I think it's good for college football. But I think they're going to be a five-win team and just miss out on being a bowl team and just miss bowl eligibility. But – we know Travis Hunter is going to be a top 10 pick. We know Shador Sanders is going to be a top 10 pick. It's kind of crazy that you could have two top 10 picks in the NFL draft and you may not even make a bowl game this year. It is, but in the greatest team sport we know, it kind of shows you how hard it is to, to win with just a couple guys. Like in the NBA, college basketball, you get a couple ballers, you can win the whole thing, right? Like it's just, you know, with only five players in the field, you play both ways. In this sport, like if you don't have an offensive line, you Shador is going to be running for his life. And it's only going to get worse because the talent that they're facing, and I think Nebraska next week is going to be a real challenge for him. 
That's going to get that more challenging. The offensive lines they play are going to be better and more challenging. Um, but I, it just, to me, it speaks more about how hard it is to build a roster. And the way Dion is doing it is through this, you know, hyper, like they, the first year he took the job, we knew there were going to be like 45, 50 new players, which is expected. That happens a lot with new coaches. I didn't expect it to happen again, but that's what he did. Like he churned it over again. And I think that's a big challenge too. And that's why I think, look at the guys who played well. They were the players that were there last year. Jimmy Horn Jr. was there last year. He sure. lit it up through the receiving. Travis Hunter was there last year. Shador was there last year. Shiloh Sanders played pretty well, though there are some cheap shots, but he played pretty well. Like the players that struggled, the ones that were out of positions are the ones that are still trying to figure out the system. So I don't, instead of trying to develop players, it seems Dion's trying to go out and just simply upgrade. And that is a big challenge, and it's something that's never been done before with a lot of success, and yet he's trying to do it. I just wonder this, too. When Shador goes to the NFL and Travis go to the NFL as well, Travis Hunter, how much longer do you think Dion's actually going to stay at Colorado, in your opinion? So you want my wildest, boldest prediction? Sure, go ahead. I'll never say no to and that. And I think it's been said. So I said this a while ago, and I'm mad because I think a couple. I think they might have even done it on first take the other day. I mean, Mike McCarthy, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, is there a hotter a coach with a hotter seat underneath him? Dak Prescott, is there a quarterback like the more pressure to win right away? Jerry Jones, is there an owner that's more willing to do something brash and brazen and say, I don't care if this coach has never coached in the NFL? Coach Prime goes to Dallas, they draft Shador, and he coaches his son in Dallas next year. That like, would be it, something. It would, it's it's crazy and it's wild. And yet I think Jerry Jones is just nuts enough to try it because he loves his guys. And we know the history that Dion had in Dallas. And also um, Jerry but, doesn't care about winning anymore. Jerry just creates about stirring up the most drama. Exactly. exactly. He really does. And that when you talk about selling tickets and being the center of conversation, my goodness, I think it would be crazy, but I think Jerry's crazy enough to do it. And there's probably about a 1% chance that this all could come to fruition. <laughs> uh, but I do, to your point, I think Dion would stick around for one. Like, I think he'd be there one more year. And then I think he'd realize how hard it is. And I don't know if he would be around longer after that. You know, and that's, that's kind of my prediction. One more year after his sons leave, he's all, you know, he's done a great job with them. I just think it's for somebody who's won as much as he has, I think it'd be really hard. And like you were talking about five and seven, they're not, I don't, if they lose Shador, which they're going to, and Travis Hunter, be worse. Good luck replacing them. They're going to be worse. And then it's like, that's hard on somebody who's won as much as he has. All right, a few more quick hitters here with Danny Cannell getting into the games this weekend. I'm fascinated to see what Clemson does. I obviously expect Georgia to win, but we know Clemson is still a good program, but they're far away from their days of being elite because Dabo just doesn't adjust to what college football is now. Uh, what do you think we see out of Clemson up against uh, Georgia? So, man, this is a this is an awesome experiment. Because Dabo is bucking the trend, as you mentioned. He's like, I don't like this transfer portal era, and I'm going to try to win with my guys. I mean, imagine at the start of NFL free agency, whenever that came around 30, 40 years ago. It was before my time, before our time. Yeah. Uh, imagine a coach being like, I don't like the free agent. I don't like free agents. <laughs> I just like the draft. Like, that's all I want to use is the draft. That's essentially what Dabo is doing. The thing that kind of makes it unique is in, you know, when you draft, there's a certain amount of players you can take. You're kind of limited. Recruiting, you can go out and get whoever you want, whoever you can get to come to your school. He has really talented players on his roster. He's got a lot of four and five stars on his roster. The issue is some of them are younger because you can't go out and get a free, you, you don't go to the portal and get a veteran with experience. Depth becomes an issue because if you lose a starter, then you might be starting a freshman instead of a transfer portal guy who comes in. So, I so I like Dab I, I like Dabo a lot. I think he's a great coach. I like the things that he stands for. I do think he cares about his players like he says he does. I do think he cares about education like he says he does. I just think he's he's being a little bit too stubborn. Like, and you don't have to you don't have to be Colorado and get forty five new players. Ohio State, I think they only have eleven new players, but there's really three that we've talked about. It's Quinshawn Judkins, it's Will Howard, and it's Caleb Downs. And there's a couple other guys that are pretty big names, but if you're if you're Clemson, you have money, you have resources, you could go get an offensive lineman, which they could use. 
They could go get another wide receiver, which they could use, and they could go get a linebacker, which they could use. And it wouldn't disrupt the culture of the locker room. It wouldn't turn guys against them. You know what it would do? It would make Clemson that much better of a team. So, But this experiment we're seeing unfold before us is how does it work? You know, it kind of looks like it's going downhill and it looks like they're not as dominant. But if they go toe to toe with Georgia, I think Dabo can say to a lot of his critics, see, I don't need all those guys. I got my guys and I'm, and trust me, trust me. He would love to say say this. If they win, oh, it's going to be insufferable. Absolutely hear it. These are my guys. We don't need anybody else. And if they lose, but it's by a field goal, I think you'll hear it after the season. When the critics come back, he'll say, remember that game against Georgia? We were close. But yeah, if they win, guaranteed he goes in on all his critics. Does Miami beat Florida? I actually like Florida at home. I like Miami this season. I like them to compete. I like them to win the ACC. I had Florida State. I would maybe switch it because of what we saw, but I'm not giving up on that totally. But I think the one thing I've learned and the one thing I keep reminding myself, as good as this roster is in the transfer portal era, it does take time for continuity, chemistry, timing, rhythm, things that matter in the sport. It takes time to develop that. Florida has a lot more guys returning. Miami has a lot of guys that are coming in that are uber talented, but they haven't played together yet. And this is one of the toughest environments in the country to go in at the swamp. Um, I think it's going to be a bloodbath. I really like the under because I think it'll be a defensive you know, sort of affair. I think both teams want to establish the run. I would take the points, but I don't hate Florida to win either. Like, I think Florida could win the game outright. And then I think Miami would be okay. Like, I think they could still get better and find that rhythm and find that timing. And Cam Ward could be one of the most electric players in the country. But I I just, I kind of like the Gators at home at the Swamp. Danny Cannell, who do you think is more likely to lose this weekend? Is it James Franklin's Penn State team going to West Virginia? Or is it Marcus Freeman having to go up against Texas A&M? Oh, um. More likely to lose. I mean, the point spread's tighter, so I would, you know, Notre Dame is kind of easier. Um, more pressure, I think, is clearly James Franklin. You know, it's around eight and a half, nine points. Um, with a perception of West Virginia. I'm curious to see what his, you know, new offense looks like with a new offensive coordinator. They brought in Andy Colton and Nikki from Kansas. I think Notre Dame's gonna have a tougher time. Like I think I think Notre Dame's gonna lose. I like Texas Texas AM, lay the two and a half, lay the three, wherever it is right now. I just their offensive line is really young and inexperienced, and they have to go in. We were talking about Florida Field, the swamp. Kyle Field's one of the toughest places to play as well. You got Mike Elko, the head coach at Texas AM. I think he knows Riley Leonard, the quarterback at, Te- at Notre Dame. I think he knows his tendencies, haven't seen him on his own team at Duke in practice every day. But the one thing I do think that that would make me give Notre Dame some hope, their defense will travel. Like this is a defensive team that can that can provide some problems on the road for Texas A&M's offense. So I I lean underdogs and I lean uh, unders on the totals in general. That's kind of my philosophy going into this weekend. That's the one that I'm like I think I like a home favorite because I just I think the Aggies are going to have the edge and I really like Mike Elko. Check out Bet Online for updated college football playoff, win totals, conference, Heisman, and college football week one lines. He is Danny Cadell. Before we let you run, I'm going Georgia against Alabama in the national championship game with Georgia defeating Alabama 27 to 17. What's your natty pick? Oh, I don't have a score, but I'll give you I'll give you the matchup. So I have Oregon Love it. with Dan Lanning facing. His old mentor, his old boss, Kirby Smart and the Georgia Bulldogs. But I have Oregon winning it all. I've and it there's just something about I love the fact we had a new player last year in Michigan. Oregon feels like they're on the cusp of knocking down the door. They've been close, they've been getting closer. Dylan Gabriel, I think, is going to pick up right where Bo Nix left off, and their defense has been more physical. They have a ton of weapons on the offensive side of the ball. So I'm gonna say, and it's it's kind of crazy because i was watching some film of ohio state they are stacked but they do uh oregon plays ohio state at home so i'm gonna go oregon over the georgia bulldogs he is danny cannell danny could talk to you for about like 50 more minutes but my producers (laughs) would be like dragging me out of the The studio here baby i love it i could talk it all day too there he is danny cannell always does a great job whether it's for sirius or also cbs sports hq and also here with us today once again uh on behalf of our friends at bet online